So all of a sudden, now you've got a human connection to this planting of the flag, saying this property, our property, our house, as a lot of people refer to it, is going to be X, X, and X, whatever those things are. And we don't flip a switch and all of a sudden improve the menu. We don't flip a switch and all of a sudden improve the conditions of the rooms. However, we can do that over time. And we can do that by enrolling people in a, in a mission and in a vision that is bigger than them. This is Hospitality One to One, conversations on the industry. Here's your host, Chris Bettis. Thanks for joining us in the Hospitality One to One podcast. He's a mentor, a coach, a leader. John Clemson, otherwise known as Coach K, became a master salesman in 2001. Once he cracked the code to storytelling through sales, he quickly became known as the executive whisperer, traveling around the globe to share his secrets through unconventional training and team-building workshops. He's helped clients achieve sales valued in the hundreds of millions and sales teams achieve annual revenues in the billions. And now, John Clemson. John, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure, Chris. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. No problem. Let's just get right into it, if we will, because there's like a lot to go over. You know, okay. So, as you know, we like to focus on the employer brand and, of course, bettering the candidate experience. What have you noticed in your training that a company um, that would help a company build a better employer brand, if you will? Well, the employer brand is reflected in who you have walking around, either holding that business card or having an email address with that indicates that you work there. The, the people really are the brand because the people create the experience, the people interact with the customers, the clients, the visitors, the guests, whatever they may be. When we're talking about hotels in particular, because of the fact that they, they are flagged and some are owned by management companies, some are owned by the actual brand that's on the front of the hotel. It really is a personal and local experience. And I think that the key is, starts with how you select your new employees. The way that you impact the people that are there is by adding people to the team that enhance the, the character, the tone, and the ability to accomplish tasks of the current team. And interviewing is critical. Why? Well, because I believe that the people that, that walk in and out of the building every day to work for the brand, again, whether it's a hotel or any other kind of organization, but we'll focus on hotels. You know, the, the fascinating thing to me over the years that I've worked with different hotels of all different sizes and, and management companies is that the hotel business is a 24-hour business. It was pointed out to me in one of my visits to a property that there are no locks on the front door. So who can we attract? How do we identify the best talent that's going to be able to perform in that kind of environment where they could potentially be on call at any time? So I think it really boils down to us thinking about, when I say us, I think about, I'm talking about the hiring authority and the people involved in hiring and selecting. I think it boils down to how we go about interviewing. And what that means to me is how many people that currently work at the property are going to be interviewed by potential new employees. And, and it's important that it's more than one person because this gives the candidate a sense that they are truly being evaluated, vetted, and potentially welcomed in because they've met more than one person. Second, what meeting more than one person does on the interviewer side is that if it's Chris, it's, if it's like you and I and and John and and someone else decided to interview one person, and we did that over a period of time at, that they're visiting the property. It gives us the opportunity to explore different things in the interview. And one of the keys for me is that there should be one question, at, at a minimum one question, that every person that meets the potential candidate asks so that we can get multiple answers from the candidate and we can compare notes later. It's really critical that in order to support the brand that we want to create, the image that we want out in the community or to our customers, wherever they may be coming from, it real, really boils down to the people that we employ. 
Now, you've given a number of great tips, suggestions for helping to improve your employer brand or, I guess, establish an employer brand. But let's mm-hmm. let's look at this from a hotel, large, small, branded, independent, does not matter. This okay. hotel has a less than desirable employer brand. They may have a number of things they have to do to fix this, but let's start from square one. If you could whittle it down to one I guess the first most important step any hotel can take to write their employer brand, what would that be? I would have them bring everyone together and talk about how they as a group and and under the flag, under the brand, want to be perceived. One of the things, or if not the key thing, that virtually everybody, regardless of their background, regardless of their role, regardless of their level of education, the one thing that all of us are fascinated with, Chris, is the future. And you know, one of my idols is Galileo, and he said the only way to predict the future is to create it. And we live in a world where people are, I believe, tapping into their creativity more and more. And if you can, with the current people that you have, if you can bring them into a room, even if it's a stand-up meeting, and challenge them to think about how you they how they would like the brand that they operate under to be perceived, again, by the community or by the clients or or even by previous guests. What that does is it starts to create a common language among everyone that is walking around in the property, and it's about the future. Whatever has happened, whatever has damaged our brand in the past is there. We can't change that. What we can do is we can create a brand new version. We can create a brand new experience, no pun intended, using the word brand there, uh, <laughs> by, by getting people to think, okay, if you were to hear that our hotel was having issues. What would you want the person sitting next to them at the coffee shop to say? Well, we would want them to say something like, you know, that's funny because I just had lunch there and it really looks like the people love working there. I I, I just went by there and and I was in a meeting and man, you know, it, it, it was, it was in much better condition than I had heard. So it really is to me, again, it goes back to the people, but in order to, to improve the impression of the brand or the perception of the brand. We have to enroll the people in the building in what we are all here to do. I I call it planting the flag. And I've done this with several organizations. Uh, One of them was uh, Sunstone Properties, who who owned a a, a bunch of hotels. They grew to a very significant number of hotels, and then they were fortunate enough to sell to uh, Intercontinental. And one of the things that we had several properties do was that we, we said, what are the three key things that we believe make us useful, powerful, unique, the best place to stay in town. And they wrote them on a flag. And then what they did was they had everyone sign the back of the flag. They framed the flag and had everyone sign somewhere on the mat around the flag, and they put it in the lobby. So all of a sudden, now you've got a human connection to this planting of the flag, saying this property, our property, our house, as a lot of people refer to it, is going to be X, X, and X, whatever those things are. And we don't flip a switch and all of a sudden improve the menu. We don't flip a switch and all of a sudden improve the conditions of the rooms. However, we can do that over time, and we can do that by enrolling people in a, in a mission and in a vision that is bigger than them. Wow, that's fantastic advice. Now, you have been quite successful in the authorship circle, if you will. You've actually written a number of successful books, uh, uh, books titled things like uh, How to Sell Without Being a Jerk, The Ultimate Sales Manager's Guide, or Move the Sale Forward, among others. Um, Does anyone you know use your books in their training processes? As a matter of fact, I do. I'm currently working with a mobile app development company in Southern California called Dogtown Media. And my the uh, that book with the tongue-in-cheek title, How to Sell Without Being a Jerk, is uh, required reading. When I worked with Sunstone, uh, that book was required re- required reading. And some years ago, I had the privilege of working with the, the leadership at Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts. And I did a, uh, a manager session in Chicago, Illinois, 
after which they had everyone running anything having to do with sales. They had them read the ultimate sales manager's guide. And then one of my biggest success stories is not a hotel company, but it has turned into one of the biggest brands in the world. And that's indeed.com. And indeed is currently the largest employment site in the world. And they have sales offices on, on multiple continents in multiple, multiple cities. When I started working with them in 2008, they had just around 50 salespeople. Just recently, they had their global leadership conference of of all of the leaders in sales, and there were over 170 of those leaders leading a 1,500-person sales force. And for the last seven years, my sales management book, The Ultimate Sales Manager's Guide, has not only been required reading for everybody who leads a sales team, they've gone through a cycle of training with me everyone that leads a sales team and and the folks who those sales directors report to. So um, the books have, uh, have had what the, the publisher always looks for, which is a publishing phrase called that book has legs. And Chris, what that means is that it's selling well, at least 24 months after publication, these books are uh, have more than 24 months on them. And the two how to Sell Without Being a Jerk and The Ultimate Sales Manager's Guide have been available on Audible, rather, audible.com as audiobooks. And I read most of the content. And what that means is, as you know, because we've had several conversations before, once you get me worked up on a topic, I have a couple of things to say. So we <laughs> <laughs> didn't only just read the book, I would say, okay, and that makes me think of something. And the producers said, you understand you got six hours of audio here. I said, look, no one's going to become a great sales manager overnight. Let's give them enough content and and engaging content where they're going to want to put it into practice. So depending on how people learn, they can either read these books or they can listen to the two of them. Well, John, you and I both enjoy a good conversation. I think that's why we uh, we hit it off because, uh, in my case, uh, why use two words when you can use six? You know, just that's how I think about things. <laughs> Yes, you're never at a shortage for words. No, you know that. no, I was told there's no such thing as Chris was speechless. No, no. I, I was told as a as a youngster, Reader's Digest version, Reader's Digest version. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But here's the great news is that you've become a, a very adept storyteller. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you and I, uh, you and I uh, speak the same language here. We really do. Uh, <laughs> so now, you know, we know that you're an accomplished coach and accomplished, um, you know, when it comes to speaker for sales organizations. But how about when it comes to working with organizations? Have you ever had to help hire and train a sales staff or are you brought in only after the hire? I uh, I would say about a third of my practice is helping organizations scale their sales teams. And, and I appreciate you asking me about that because this is something I'm very, very passionate about. The Again, so at the beginning, we were talking about how do we bring people in? How many people do they have to interview with? What does it look like when they first come on board? And, and I have this process that I take companies through where they are looking to scale. And, and the, the, the magic word scale today is a very tech sounding thing. What a effectively means is taking your sales team from its current size to a minimum of doubling that size while hopefully increasing revenue by a larger multiple. And it depends on the industry as to what that will work out to be. And what I do is I get involved from the initial writing and editing of a job description to be posted wherever it may be to conducting phone screen interviews. I'm a big fan of a 30-minute phone screen interview because it is Interviewing over the phone is extremely difficult. And if I'm going to hire salespeople, I want to know that they can hang, that they can step up, that they can perform, whether it's over the phone or face-to-face in front of groups at a trade show. And one of the hardest is the phone because the thing about the phone is that you don't get to make eye contact with me. You cannot see my expressions. You can't see if I'm smiling or if I'm looking away. So you have the responsibility immediately to not only capture my attention, but to keep it. Those folks that do, and it's not everybody, those folks that do, then I bring them in for a face-to-face interview, and I have them interview with the the folks at the organization before I meet them face-to-face, because those folks have to make sure that these people have are a cultural fit, that they have the right personality for the role, that they are adept enough to either learn the industry or speak intelligently about the industry 
now. And those are key things. Are they a cultural fit? Do they think they will, this person will kind of work in with the esteem, the feel who we are? And then second, do they have the personality for the role? Then what I do is I, I have my clients adopt a nine day onboarding process. It looks different for everybody, but Chris, here's the thing. I've found over the many years that I've been doing this, that the first nine days of employment, especially for a salesperson, are critical to making sure that that person has tenure, that they stay a minimum of 14 months. Why? Because it costs a fortune to train people. It is an, an amazing distraction from the work at hand. We have to get them up to speed technologically. We have to get them to fit into the culture, and then we need to get them to produce. And guess what? It's probably unrealistic to expect any kind of production out of a salesperson earlier than 90 days. I would love to see them close a deal in the first 30. I'm not so hot about that. It's important that they have a pipeline in the second 30, and they must close something. I don't care how small. They have to close something in, in, in before 89 days. Because if they don't, guess what? We all made a mistake. They're not for the role. So my involvement, yes, it starts prior to hiring. It's involved in hiring, and it's involved in onboarding. And then many companies ask me to work with their salespeople once they're on board for a 90-day period, get them up and running get them focused on my approach to planning and manage, managing their activities during the day, how they approach the phone, what questions they ask, and that's when we pull out the curriculum. And the curriculum is for salespeople is move the sale forward and how to sell without being a jerk. And the two of them together really equip a salesperson. They don't assume, there's no assumption that a salesperson being hired needs to learn everything. What we need to do, our responsibility as an employer, is to elevate their skills, elevate their their vision of what they're capable of so that they can enjoy the work, they can outperform what our expectations were, and oh, by the way, we get a return on investment. So based on the first part of your answer, you had said that, Phone screens are not necessarily the most objective way, if you will, to find out about a particular candidate, sales candidate, for example. Uh, however, we know they're a necessary evil. So given the fact that you know, we may have someone listening today who is up for a phone interview, what tips can you offer them to give them the best chance, especially because they can't show body language, they can't give eye mm. contact? What do you right. suggest? Well, if I'm going to be interviewed, and I know that it's going to be a phone interview. I'm going to follow the first rule of, of success for any meeting. And it does, doesn't matter what the meeting's about. If it's an interview, if it's a pitch, if it's a client meeting, if it's a, uh, dealing with your boss, it doesn't matter. If you're going to a meeting, guess what? The first rule of success is prepare. If you're going to interview with my property, maybe you want to drive by and get a sense of where it's located. Maybe you want to walk into the lobby, look at the leaderboard, and find out what kind of events we have going on there. Maybe you want to just get a sense of availability. And even you can, uh, you and I know this, Chris, I, we can walk into a hotel, walk by the registration desk, walk into the main lobby, and in about 90 seconds, get a sense as to the overall tone there. You can hear the people behind the front desk that are, that are handling, uh, uh, checking in and checking out. Whether or not hospitality is like woven into who these folks are. The other way to prepare is to absolutely have two questions prepared in advance in case your interviewer asks, what questions do you have for me? The last thing you want is for them to ask you that and you don't have any. So if you're going to be interviewed, you prepare. What does that mean? Well, it means that you make sure you're not going to be anywhere where your dog is going to be barking. Even though you, we all know that, that dogs at work are a totally different thing than they, are, than they used to be, having a dog barking, having cars slamming doors, having weird noises in the background during your interview are not good for you. So get to a controlled environment, make sure you have a great connection with your cell phone, and be prepared. Next thing is listen well, have pen and paper to take notes with. I'm not a fan of me interviewing someone and they're taking notes on their laptop because what I hear is, I'm sorry, that's distracting. This is a focused experience and you want to be relaxed, you want to be undistracted, you want to be open, and you want to be authentic. Relaxed, undistracted, open, and authentic. So being interviewed is very difficult. Keep in mind that you're not selling yourself, you're selling the service you provide. 
Now, since you had so much sales experience, without going into great detail, because obviously that's what your books and your training are for, from, I guess, a 50,000-foot overview, everyone knows the difference between a good salesperson and a bad salesperson. No matter what industry, you know the difference between the two. Yeah. All right? What's less able to be discerned is between a good salesperson and a great salesperson. What mm. do great salespeople, what's the one attribute they tend to all have? They listen. They listen. They listen. And I don't mean they sit nodding, waiting for an opportunity to speak. I mean that great salespeople, when you're in the room with them, regardless of the conditions, you get this innate sense that they have all day. They are not on their way somewhere else. They're not looking to hurry up and close the deal. And no matter what it is that the prospect wants to talk about, the salesperson has all day to listen to it. And great salespeople truly listen. They wait a half a beat after the person talking has completed their statement. And then they ask an insightful, intuitive question. But it all goes back to that one thing, Chris. You know, uh, I've said before, the most difficult thing for an adult human to do is to completely focus their attention on someone else. That makes sense. That makes complete sense. Now, if we can, let's focus on you for a moment. If we can here. Well, if you insist. If I insist. Makes me un- very uncomfortable, but okay. No, okay, but you twisted my arm. So, how you've been a successful author, you've done, uh, you've got a great, uh, very successful podcast. Um, how did you get to this point? Where, what made you get into this field when it comes to the, the sales coaching, the podcast? How'd you get to where you are today? Discipline. I I would love to think that I'm uh, smarter than the average bear. However, as soon as I start convincing myself of that, I turn the corner and I have a conversation with someone who is nine times smarter than I am. I would love to think that it is an issue of talent. However, there's an old saying that says, you know, there there are millions of talented people who cannot find any work. Um, uh, I would love to think that it's been the connections and the relationships, but it's none of those. It is the fact that I sat down many years ago, and I examined how consistently performing people achieved consistent performance. And I keep boiling it down, reducing it down, whittling it down, and it all, the kernel at the center of all of it is discipline. And my definition of discipline is following a regular proven path. We can stand around and we can talk about what it means to go out and do business development, or I can pick up the phone, or I can go to an event, and I can get busy doing it. And when I started my practice some years ago, I dedicated specific time, large chunks of time out of the day, and said, this is the only activity I will engage in for this entire period of time. And oh, by the way, I will do it consistently again and again and again. And, you know, you mentioned the podcast. Well, I think one of the reasons that we've gotten to the point where we have over 8,000 downloads a month is that we are consistent in vetting guests, in doing the best we can to prepare for the interview, and positioning the guests to the point where they want to share it with others because you know that I'm going to share this podcast with my audience. I'm hoping that you're going to share it. Of course, you're going to share it with your audience and it comes down to discipline. We can, we can tap it once and hope it works or we can consistently touch and refine and build it over time so that the discipline wins out uh, of all of the things that are attributes of successful people. Discipline is, to me, from my research, my study, my personal experience, it is the common thread, the, 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 the essential kernel that you don't need to have a degree, you don't need to have connections, you don't need to have shiny shoes to be able to implement. Anyone listening to this can begin a new discipline tomorrow. And the question is, after 21 consistent days in a row, are they still exercising that discipline? And that's, to me, Chris, that's where, that's where the real test is. You do it for a couple of days, that's all great, fun, and wonderful. Show me 21 days in a row. Show me 57 days in a row. Show me 190 days in a row. And all of a sudden, 
you will have built things that you didn't know that you were capable of. And discipline is actually an attribute that can work across not just your your professional but your personal life as well, actually. No question. So it is, look, it's a, it's a spiritual concept. It's a physical concept. It is a mental concept. It is a, a selling concept, a leadership concept. I mean, think about it. Some of the folks listening to this are looking to hire salespeople or are currently managing salespeople. Well, it's critical that the leader demonstrates discipline, doesn't talk about it, mm-hmm. does it. Actions speak louder than words. Yes. You know what the great American philosopher Chris Rock said? He said that what you are doing speaks so loudly, I can't hear a word that you say. That is a bold statement. Yeah, man. So uh, back to you, of course. Uh, when, <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to your success, you actually uh, a little birdie told me that you may have a new project in the wings. Can you share what that oh. is? Yes, we're so excited about this, and thank you very much for for allowing me to um, promote it here. Some months ago, a uh, friend of mine and someone who I have have tremendous admiration for, a gentleman named Isaac Noor, he is a designer and inventor and a futurist. And when I first met him and he told me he was a futurist, I looked at him and I said, boy, it takes a lot of nerve to call yourself that. And then we spoke for about 45 minutes, and I thought, yeah, this guy can tell the future. He is deeply ingrained in artificial intelligence, uh, artificial reality, the the designing of technologies. He is someone who has been invited to the Worldwide Developer Conference at Apple in Cupertino multiple times. And if you know anything about the Apple world, being invited once – is pretty special. More than once is rare. And Isaac and I sat down and we were talking about things that we both find fascinating. I had him as a guest more than once on our podcast, and it moved into this project that we are are very excited about, which is called Stream. Stream is an audiobook formatted educational piece that explores flow, and what Isaac refers to as hacking your consciousness. And what it's about, Chris, is tapping into our highest level of creativity, understanding discipline, design, creativity, connection, communication, and flow. And it is something that we're just so over the moon excited about. It can be explored at the website streamthebook.com. And we're, we're just, we're beside ourselves. We, we're literally, we're staying up at night trying to figure out how to get the word out to more people because the initial responses from uh, a, a sampling of, um, uh, what do you call it, test group have been just wonderful. We're beyond what we expected, honestly. This is absolutely terrific. What a, a revolutionary, if you will, uh, if you will um, idea. It, you know, we, we believe that it has not been done before. We, we, we prepared in advance before going into the recording studio. We sat down with a, with a framework and an outline, and then we explored them together. I learned from him. He learned from me. We hope that listeners learn from both of us, learn not from us individually, but from the conversation. And uh, I don't think this has ever been done before. Uh, I know that my audio books were founded in something that took me four months to write. These, this was a five month project that was constantly iterated, was created in real time. And the urgency of the recording is it, it just one of our uh, early listener folks uh, referred to it as electric. That's very, very exciting. So it's people can get to this with streamthebook.com, correct? That's correct, yes. And they'll be asked to give us their email address. They'll get early access as a result. Uh, that means a sample chapter plus a uh, kind of a, a user's guide piece that will come to them. And then uh, it'll show them how to acquire it. And right now, audible.com will be the first outlet for this. There probably will be more later. Now, if people wish to get a hold of you, how can they reach, reach you? It's real easy. John, J-O-H-N, at Klimshin, and I'll spell that for your listening audience, K-L-Y, M like Mary, S like Sam, 
H-Y-N-LikeNancy.com. I, uh, I'm available to anybody for questions for how they think that what I teach might be useful to them or um, how they can learn more about uh, about who you really are and, uh, you know, <laughs> your, your podcast persona. <laughs> so um, I guess my question for you also is how can people get a hold of uh, any of the books you have? Well, uh, if you go to Amazon.com, uh, which is the, the world's marketplace right now, any any search engine that you go in on the, the Amazon front page, just type in my last name. I just gave the spelling. It's very unique. Mm-hmm. It'll pull you to the page that has all of my work um, in addition to the, the business publications that I have done. I've written a novel, a novella, and a, a compendium of short stories. So all of those book are, books are available on Amazon.com. That is outstanding information here john i greatly appreciate it what we're going to do we're going to put a link both to the amazon sites for uh, the books as well as we'll put a link to stream the, the book.com for this new endeavor as well as we'll have john's contact information all that will be listed on the hospitality one to one.com website john i appreciate your busy you have a busy schedule appreciate your time thank you so very much well, it's my pleasure, and uh, I'm looking forward to listening to other episodes of the Hospitality One to One podcast. Wonderful. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We're also available at facebook.com forward slash hospitality one to one. That's hospitality, the number one, number two, and number one. We're also on Twitter at hospitality one to one and www.hospitality one to one.com.